What's driving recent protests in China? Is there more to the unrest than the Xi Jinping government's zero COVID policy? And what really should be the world's outlook on what's going on in China? Hello and welcome to Worldview at The Hindu with me, Sahasini Heather. This is actually episode number 90. And we're going to look at what has happened inside China and whether there are portents for the future over there, just weeks after what seemed to be a grand celebration of the Chinese Communist Party's achievements, the CCP meeting, came protests in several Chinese cities, many college campuses, very importantly, calling for an end to the government's zero COVID strategy, the restrictions, the brutal lockdowns and the crackdowns on people suspected to have COVID, with even some of the protesters and the protests we saw even in Beijing calling for Xi Jinping and the CCP to step down. Finally, in what seemed to be a softening of the government's tone, Vice Premier Sun Chunlan actually chaired a meeting where she indicated COVID protocols could now be reviewed. Now, these protests have really been building for a while, but we want to take you a little back to what uh, the zero COVID policy actually means. Uh, remember, most of the world has made many mistakes over the last three years of the COVID pandemic. Uh, but since the virus was first detected, it has now moved out of the pandemic phase or the panic phase of the pandemic, if you like, using different means. Now, what the rest of the world really worked on, and this includes India, were initial periods of lockdowns that then stopped after a year because it became clear that that was not the way forward. You can't keep economies just tied down endlessly. The second step was the universal vaccinations. Once vaccines were found, particularly here in India, uh, two doses were given and the booster then offered. A stepped up testing, testing across the uh, countries, but particularly at airports, checking incoming passengers, uh, and then letting natural immunities kick in, even herd immunities some spoke about. Now, in contrast to all of that, the Chinese Communist Party, and particularly Xi Jinping, who sees it as one of his successes, spoke of a different path, what was called a zero COVID strategy. That means, uh, according to the CCP, to reduce virus transmission to near zero levels, and then ultimately eliminate the virus within a specified geographic region. So in other words, stop the transmission and curb as much as possible uh, the virus uh, where it is found. So what that meant was frequent lockdowns that continue till today. You see one case of COVID in China in one city and you'll see a lockdown in that area. Quarantines for buildings, localities, and even cities, if even that one case is found. Mass testing, in fact, mandatory regular testing for all citizens, monitoring of testing through health apps. So you can't really leave uh, cities without having your health app up to date on your tests. All shops and businesses in areas where there are cases are shut down. So look at the economic impact of that. Mandatory quarantine centers for those testing positive. Uh, and then, of course, the vaccine policy with uh, the Chinese vaccines that not everyone thought were very effective, but they began with the working population, the younger population, and then moved on uh, to the older population. So prioritize the working population. Now, Chinese authorities have defended these policies by saying that China has much fewer deaths than the rest of the world, uh, especially given China has the world's largest population. So what are those figures according to the World Health Organization? And these are, remember, reported cases. Uh, while the world had 639 million cases of COVID-19 with 6.6 .6 million deaths, China accounted for just 9 million cases and 30,000 deaths. So if you look at China's population compared to the rest, uh, it has done very well. And of course, these are reported figures by the Chinese authorities. Much may have been suppressed as well, but these are what the WHO says. Even so, despite this perceived success, the protests that seem to be coming after a number of different incidents indicated that people are just tiring of the daily restrictions now. And particularly, uh, you know, looking around at the rest of the world over the internet and seeing that the rest of the world is actually being able uh, to, make, uh, 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 to make progress and to move around. Uh, in particular, if you see the Qatar World Cup, the FIFA World Cup that we saw, um, uh, where people came together really without even seeming to wear masks. In China in particular, what we saw over the, just the last two months, in September, 27 people on a quarantine bus were killed in an accident on their way to a quarantine center in southwest uh, China in Guizhou. 
Uh, now, of course, that was blamed on the fact that there was this need for restrictions everywhere. In November then, the cases of a three-year-old boy who died in Lanzhou and a woman in Xi'an who miscarried due to COVID restrictions caught the national attention as well. Uh, we also saw those near riots at the Foxconn factory for iPhone parts in Zhengzhou and at an IKEA store in Shanghai where shoppers really uh, tried to escape when there was a COVID alert of some sort. So these were the videos that were really going viral everywhere. And then last week, there was this apartment fire in the town of Urumqi in Xinjiang in the extreme uh, northwest. And Urumqi had been under a 100-day lockdown. Uh, in that fire, 10 people were killed, including children. And what looked like emergency workers trying to get in but delayed by COVID restrictions. Uh, there were uh, fire engines that were trying to get in, but because those areas were under lockdown, it was very difficult. Now, as word spread of that horrible incident, social media, Weibo in particular, carried images that sparked protests in nearly a dozen cities. And if you look across uh, the map of China where we're seeing this protest, they really are everywhere. Of course, the most surprising, the most unprecedented part of that was what was happening in Beijing itself in the really in the spotlight uh, and where uh, the world media is actually and was able to capture many of those protests. So the fact was that these protests may have happened in other parts of the world. They have happened over time. Why was this seen as so unprecedented? Firstly, because of the kind of close watch the Chinese police has kept, uh, but also because there was this global reaction to it. Uh, how did other countries react? Here's US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, of course, supporting any kind of protest in China. World Bank Chief Kristalina Georgieva actually made some very strong remarks saying that uh, China must consider whether to review or recalibrate its policies. Listen in. We have been recommending for some time now a recalibration of China's zero COVID policy, exactly because of the impact it has both on people and on the economy. And then here in India, here's what the Minister of State for the Ministry of External Affairs, Minakshi Lekhi, said. She was speaking to Indian chi channel Weon about what to make of the protests in China. Uh, uh, those are uh, for the world to see and those are for the country to control within. And uh, I would only say that uh, no country in the world uh, can uh, be an island by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have greater interaction, a greater working methodology. And if uh, the behaviors and uh, uh, conduct needs to be altered, keeping in view the uh, worldview, uh, that should happen with everyone. Mm -hmm. So India so far being a little more um, uh, cautious on commenting on any of these protests. Of course, India hasn't uh, really commented on what it calls the internal affairs there in China. So what was it like there on the ground? As I said, the world's media was there and also there was the Hindu's correspondent, Anand Krishnan, uh, who has himself been having to deal with these restrictive policies, with the mandatory testing. Uh, and I asked him about what he had seen right there in the Chinese capital. And remember, it came just two weeks or three weeks after Worldview. We had Anant on talking about President Xi Jinping and the CCP, what seemed to be a real high for the party at the Congress. So I asked him, really, how did these protests erupt so suddenly? Well, Suhasini, if it uh, does seem uh, sudden, in, in fact, I think uh, there were frustrations that were building up over the last year. Uh, which is the third year of the zero COVID policy in China. Uh, I think that there were a lot of expectations among people that after the 20th Party Congress in October, there would be an easing up. So I think people were somewhat patient, uh, hoping, hoping for that to happen. But I think the fact that even after the Congress, you had this wave of cases and harsher restrictions, I think deflated a lot of people's expectations. And I think that played a part in it. Uh, so I think that in many ways, if the protest did seem sudden, uh, it's been building up after three years of very difficult restrictions under which uh, people in China have been living, of course, exacting a very big economic and social uh, toll as well uh, because of the policy. And in fact, Anand, how bad were the zero COVID restrictions? Uh, give us a bit of your own experience on these. Uh, and really, has the government's promise to relax some of these come because of the protests? 
Well, the biggest problem, I think, for a lot of people uh, with the zero COVID restrictions was the uncertainty. If there's a single case of COVID uh, in your compound, you can be taken away to quarantine if you're deemed a close contact. Uh, and of course, if you test positive as well, you will be taken forcibly to central quarantine. There's a mass testing regime that a lot of people have gotten increasingly uh, frustrated with. Uh, in Here in Beijing, for example, I have to take a test every uh, 48 hours now to enter a building, a public building, a hospital, uh, a shopping mall. Uh, and these tests are done in government centers. You can't self-administer them. So people line up for sometimes uh, quite a long time. Uh, and of course, now it's really cold in Beijing, lining up in the winter cold to take a test. And you need the result on your Beijing Health app. Uh, and only with that, a QR code essentially governs your life in China. And I think a lot of people are frustrated uh, with this entire sort of toll that it takes. Now, we've seen so many forms of those protests, many people not even holding up placards, just holding up white pieces of paper because they said everyone knows what we are protesting about, but we could get into trouble for actually saying it. Um, is this only about the zero COVID policy restrictions or is it a larger picture? Is it about the larger economic scenario, the worries there? I think certainly that the driving force for these protests is frustration with the lockdowns. The immediate trigger was a recent fire uh, in the city of Urumqi in Western China, where at least 10 people died and the response was widely seen uh, as being delayed by lockdown measures. And it's something that really struck a chord with people because that can happen to anyone in China. They've seen what happens when your compounds are locked down and exits are barred and if it could happen to anybody here. And I think that's what really uh, made this tragedy resonate with so many people. And I would say that uh, frustration over lockdowns coupled with the fact uh, that there's such an economic depression in China because of these measures were the driving force for these protests in college campuses. More than 50 college campuses have seen protests. And some of, in, in some of these protests, the calls have gone uh, beyond economic concerns, beyond the lockdown concerns, uh, to actually call for democracy, uh, to call for freedom of speech, to call for a free press even. Uh, so it remains to be seen whether uh, these calls get a broader traction. But the way I see it, it seems to me that the guiding, uh, the main driving force is indeed frustration with lockdowns. And I think if the Chinese leadership was to announce major easing of lockdowns, I think they would be addressing the major grievances uh, of the protesters. Now, what's interesting, and here in India, many have drawn these parallels because uh, just this week, Jiang Zemin, seen as the leader who took China's economy to new heights and globalized, in a sense, China and the world, he passed away. Uh, how much could his death be a rallying point for more protests? Uh, how really is Jiang being remembered in China? And why are these parallels to 1989 and the Tiananmen protests really being made? Well, that's right. The, the passing away of Jiang Zemin, of course, has come at such an extraordinary political time in China. Uh, people are immediately thinking of parallel to 89 when the death of another former leader then, Hu Yaobang, galvanized the student movement. Of course, uh, they're very different in the sense that Hu Yaobang was very popular and beloved uh, in a degree that you can't really say was the case for Jiang Zemin. But what you have seen is on social media, there's been an outpouring of nostalgia for the time that Jiang Zemin was leading China, which is, of course, in the 1990s. And many people still here see it as a time of openness. And I think it's fair to say that one reason for this outpouring of nostalgia is frustration with the current times. There's no doubt, I think that's also fueling some of the emotion, but it remains to be seen whether that translates into something else. I'd say the biggest barrier to that happening is uh, China right now is of course seeing a huge security deployment in most cities uh, that is going to make it very difficult for people to come out. Our correspondent Anand Krishnan there and of course you can see more of his coverage at www.thehindu.com or on Anand's page and in fact he and my colleague Amit Barua have a fairly long podcast on just what sparked these protests and where they could go next. Remember for the moment those protests have died down uh, but they are evoking these uh, images of the past, of the past big protests that we have seen. The Tiananmen Square protests, of course, took place in the wake of the death of pro-reform leader Hu Yaobang. Uh, they ended after two months in June 1989 in Beijing after a police crackdown. Uh, 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 and remember those images that really had shocked the world. Like then, this week's protests also 
seem to be about the state of the economy and the daily hardships that people are facing. China's economic slowdown, particularly due to COVID-19 and the COVID-19 restrictions, now seems to be well documented. Three years later, this is what we're seeing. The GDP is expected to be down to 3.22% this year. That's fairly low. It's certainly a percentage lower than was earlier expected. Investment uh, grew just about 0.3%, so really not in comparison uh, to the past. Consumption shrank about 0.8%, uh, while exports have expanded uh, just about 1%, according to latest surveys. As a result, what we're seeing this July, the youth jobless rate, for example, which is for the 16 to 24 age group just graduating, rose to 19.9%. That's the highest figure since their National Bureau of Statistics actually began publishing this monthly data uh, about four years ago. In addition, a pro property market uh, slump is driving other indicators down as well for people. And COVID-related disruptions are, of course, affecting both Chinese supply chains, so imports for the Chinese, as well as its exports to countries, including India. And that's another reason why India is taking a closer look at what has happened. Clearly, the economic signals that sparked the protests across China are more a concern for the Xi Jinping government than these protests we saw this week over COVID regulations that could be controlled. Um, and we we'll like the demonstrations in India and other parts of the world over COVID restrictions really peter out once those restrictions are removed. However, as he starts his third term in office and as leader of the Chinese Communist Party, President Xi Jinping has now been forewarned by these protests that the greatest challenge to his leadership may come not from inner party politics, but from the people's reaction to his policies. We'll certainly track more on what's happening in China uh, for you here on Worldview. Let's also get you some reading recommendations. And I feel like I've given you so many recommendations on China. I should slow down. Uh, but here are some more pertinent to the issues we're discussing today. First, an edited work, China and COVID-19, Domestic and External Dimensions. These are, this is a book by Indian scholars. It's a book of essays edited by the uh, foremost Indian uh, scholar Srikanth Kondapalli uh, and others who have written about uh, the issue. Uh, there's another interesting book that came out more recently called Policing China, Street-Level Cops in the Shadow of Protest. This is by Suzanne Scoggins. It's a Columbia University project. And why it's interesting is because of the way China's police has been put into the fore really as a, a protest uh, a, a controller uh, in many ways. And of course, we saw this to begin with in Tibet and Xinjiang, but we're seeing it across the country. Then a book by Ian Bremer, Bremer called The Power of Crisis, How Three Threats and Our Response Will Change the World. It's certainly a broader book, not just about China, but it has a fairly detailed chapter on COVID and on China. Uh, then one of my favorites called Tiananmen Square, The Making of a Protest. Uh, this is by Vijay Gokhale. It's now out in paperback. Uh, but remember, uh, uh, he has also written two very important books on how China negotiates the long game, uh, as well as an after Tiananmen Square, you know, China's rise in the world, a former foreign secretary, a former ambassador to China as well, and a very, very clear writer. Um, a book on Xi Jinping that's come out more recently called The Most Powerful Man, obviously, uh, The Most Powerful Man in the World. Obviously, this was timed with the Party Congress. This is by Stephen Oust and Adrian Gyges. Uh, China's Leaders, a longer look, if you like, from Mao to Now by David Shambo. Uh, looks at the terms of Mao, Deng, Jiang, uh, Hu, and Xi. So all of them. And particularly, if you want to look at those chapters on Jiang Zemin and uh, uh, Xi Jinping, you might find those interesting. A more exhaustive biography of Jiang Zemin uh, from 2005 is The Man Who Changed China, The Life and Legacy of Jiang Zemin by Robert Lawrence Kuhn. And of course, Anand Krishnan, uh, my colleague, has written a fairly exhaustive uh, obituary in the Hindu as well. And then there's a book called The Bodies of Others. The New Authoritarians, COVID-19 and the War Against the Human. Again, this is not specific to China. It's just about how we have allowed authoritarianism uh, to have its way really in the world when it comes to COVID, when it comes to COVID surveillance, tracking and restrictions on people. And this is written uh, by a world famous author called Naomi Wolf. And then there's this, and of course, I'm not in favor of uh, putting out books for you that some have questioned or have called a conspiracy theory. But this one in particular did catch my attention. And here on Worldview, we've spoken in the past about the need to find out more about the origins of the COVID uh, coronavirus. 
Uh, this book is called Made in China, Wuhan, COVID and the Quest for Biotech Supremacy. This is by journalist. He's a British journalist, Jasper Becker. It is a Western point of view, but it looks really at the biotech warfare uh, in both the US and China and the research that they carried out. Uh, he had earlier authored a book called The Chinese. Um, and we certainly hope you find it interesting. It's a shortish read. Uh, and and uh, it does have some more about where the COVID virus may have come from and what explains some of China's reactions uh, to the pandemic. That's all we have time for here on Worldview from the team here. Thanks for watching.